Section 15 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 15. Appendices, Part 2. Appendix 4. Subtlety of Hand. I had intended in one or other of these lectures to have spoken at some length of the quality of refinement in color, but found the subject would lead me too far. A few words are, however, necessary in order to explain some expressions in the text. Refinement in color is indeed a tautological expression, for color, in the true sense of the word, does not exist until it is refined. Dirt exists, stains exist, and pigments exist easily enough in all places, and are laid on easily enough by all hands, but color exists only where there is tenderness, and can be laid on only by a hand which has strong life in it. The law concerning color is very strange, very noble, in some sense almost awful. In every given touch laid on canvas, if one grain of the color is inoperative and does not take its full part in producing the hue, the hue will be imperfect. The grain of color which does not work is dead. It infects all about it with its death. It must be got quit of, or the touch is spoiled. We acknowledge this instinctively in our use of the phrases dead color, killed color, foul color. Those words are, in some sort, literally true. If more color is put on than is necessary, a heavy touch when a light one would have been enough, the quantity of color that was not wanted and is overlaid by the rest is as dead, and it pollutes the rest. There will be no good in the touch. The art of painting, properly so called, consists in laying on the least possible color that will produce the required result, and this measurement in all the ultimate, that is to say the principal operations of coloring, is so delicate that not one human hand in a million has the required lightness. The final touch of any painter properly so named, of Correggio, Titian, Turner, or Reynolds, would be always quite invisible to anyone watching the progress of the work, the films of hue being laid thinner than the depths of the grooves in Mother of Pearl. The work may be swift, apparently careless, nay, to the painter himself, almost unconscious. Great painters are so organized in that they do their best work without effort. But analyze the touches afterwards, and you will find the structure and depth of the color laid mathematically demonstrable to be of literally infinite fineness, the last touches passing away at their edges by untraceable gradation. The very essence of a master's work may thus be removed by a picture cleaner in ten minutes. Observe, however, this thinness exists only in portions of the ultimate touches, for which the preparation may often have been made with solid colors, commonly and literally called dead coloring. But even that is always subtle if a master lays it, subtle at least in drawing, if simple in hue, and farther observe that the refinement of work consists not in laying absolutely little color, but in always laying precisely the right quantity. To lay on little needs indeed the rare likeness of hand, but to lay much, yet not one atom too much, and obtain subtlety, not by withholding strength, but by precision of pause, that is the master's final sign manual. Power, knowledge, and tenderness all united. A great deal of color may often be wanted, perhaps quite a mass of it, such as shall project from the canvas, but the real painter lays this mass of its required thickness and shape with as much precision as if it were a bud of a flower which he had to touch into blossom. One of Turner's loaded fragments of white cloud is modelled and gradated in an instant, as if it alone were the subject of the picture, when the same quantity of colour under another hand would be a lifeless lump. 
The following extract from a letter in the Literary Gazette of 13th November 1858, which I was obliged to write to defend a question expression respecting Turner's subtlety of hand from a charge of hyperbole, contains some interesting and conclusive evidence on the point, though it refers to pencil and chalk drawing only. I must ask you to allow me yet leave to reply to the objections you make to two statements in my catalogue, as those objections would otherwise diminish its usefulness. I have asserted that, in a given drawing, named as one of the chief in the series, Turner's pencil did not move over the thousandth of an inch without meaning, and you charge this expression with extravagant hyperbole. On the contrary, it is much within the truth, being merely a mathematically accurate description of fairly good execution in either drawing or engraving. It is only necessary to measure a piece of any ordinary good work to ascertain this. Take, for instance, Findon's engraving at the 180th page of Roger's poems, in which the face of the figure, from which, from the chin to the top of the brow, occupies just a quarter of an inch, and the space between the upper lip and chin as nearly as possible one-seventeenth of an inch. The whole mouth occupies one-third of this space, say one-fiftieth of an inch, and within that space both the lips and the much more difficult inner corner of the mouth are perfectly drawn and rounded, with quite successful and sufficiently subtle expression. Any artist will assure you that in order to draw a mouth as well as this there must be more than twenty gradations of shade in the touches that is to say in this case gradations changing with meaning within less than the thousandth of an inch but this is mere child's play compared to the refinement of a first-rate mechanical work much more of brush or pencil drawing by a master's hand in order at once to furnish you with authoritative evidence on this point, I wrote to Mr. Kingsley, tutor of Sydney Sussex College, a friend to whom I always have recourse when I want to be precisely right in any matter, for his great knowledge both of mathematics and of natural science is joined not only with singular powers of delicate experimental manipulation, but with a keen sensitiveness to beauty in art. His answer in its final statement respecting Turner's work is amazing even to me, and will, I should think, be more so to your readers. Observe the successions of measured and tested refinement. Here is number one. The finest mechanical work that I know, which is not optical, is that done by Nobert in the way of ruling lines. I have a series ruled by him on glass giving actual scales from point zero 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 two four and point zero 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 one six of an inch perfectly correct to these places of decimals and he has executed others as fine as point zero 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 one two though i do not know how far he could repeat these last with accuracy this is number one of precision and mr kingsley proceeds to number two but this is rude work compared to the accuracy necessary for the construction of the object glass of a microscope such as Ross turns out. I am sorry to omit the explanation which follows of the ten lenses composing such a glass, each of which must be exact in radius and in surface and all have their axes coincident, but it would not be intelligible without the figure by which it is illustrated so I pass to Mr. Kingsley's number three. I am tolerably familiar, he proceeds, with the actual grinding and polishing of lenses and specula, and have produced by my own hand some by no means bad optical work, and I have copied no small amount of Turner's work, and I still look with awe at the combined delicacy and precision of his hand, it beats optical work out of sight. In optical work, as in refined drawing, the hand goes beyond the eye, and one has to depend upon the feel. And when one has once learned what a delicate affair touch is, one gets a horror of all coarse work, and is ready to forgive any amount of feebleness sooner than that boldness 
which is akin to impudence. In optics the distinction is easily seen when the work is put to trial, but here too, as in drawing, it requires an educated eye to tell the difference when the work is only moderately bad. But with bold work nothing can be seen but distortion and fog, and I heartily wish the same result would follow the same kind of handling and drawing. But here the boldness cheats the unlearned by looking like the precision of the true man. It is very strange how much better our ears are than our eyes in this country. If an ignorant man were to be bold with a violin, he would not get many admirers, though his boldness was far below that of ninety-nine out of a hundred drawings one sees. The words which I have put in italics in the above extract are those which were surprising to me. I knew that Turner's was as refined as any optical work, but had no idea of its going beyond it. Mr. Kingsley's word, awe, occurring just before, is, however, as I have often felt, precisely the right one. When once we begin at all to understand the handling of any true great executor, such as that of any of the three great Venetians, of Correggio or Turner, the awe of it is something greater than can be felt from the most stupendous natural scenery. For the creation of such a system as a high human intelligence, endowed with its ineffably perfect instruments of eye and hand, is a far more appalling manifestation of infinite power than the making either of seas or mountains. After this testimony to the completion of Turner's work, I need not at length defend myself from the charge of hyperbole in the statement that, as far as I know, the galleries of Europe may be challenged to produce one sketch, footnote, a sketch, observe, not a finished drawing. Sketches are only proper subjects of comparison with each other when they contain about the same quantity of work. The test of their merit is the quantity of truth told with a given number of touches. The assertion in the catalogue which this letter was written to defend was made respecting the sketch of Rome, number 101, end footnote. That shall equal the chalk study number 45 or the feeblest of the memoranda in the 71st and following frames. Which memoranda, however, it should have been observed are stated at the 44th page to be in some respects the grandest work in grey that he did in his life. For I believe that, as manipulators, none but the four men whom I have just named, the three Venetians and Correggio, were equal to Turner and as far as I know, none of those four ever put their full strength into sketches. But whether they did or not, my statement in the catalogue is limited by my own knowledge, and as far as I can trust that knowledge, it is not an enthusiastic statement, but an entirely calm and considered one. It may be a mistake, but it is not a hyperbole. Appendix 5 I can only give, to illustrate this balcony, facsimiles of rough memoranda made on a single leaf of my notebook with a tired hand, but it may be useful to young students to see them in order that they may know the difference between notes made to get at the gist and heart of a thing and notes made merely to look neat. Only it must be observed that the best characters of free drawing are always lost even in the most careful facsimile and I should not show even these slight notes in woodcut imitation, unless the reader had it in his power by a glance at the twenty-first or thirty-fifth plates in modern painters, and yet better by trying to copy a piece of either of them, to ascertain how far I can draw or not. I refer to these plates because, though I distinctly stated in the preface that they, together with the twelfth, twentieth, thirty-fourth, and thirty-seventh, were executed on the steel by my own hand, the use of the dry point in the foregrounds of the twelfth and twenty-first plates being moreover wholly different from the common processes of etching. I find it constantly assumed that they were engraved for me, as if to direct lying in such matters were a thing of quite common usage. Figure two is the centerpiece of the balcony, but a leaf spray is omitted on the right-hand side, having been too much buried among the real leaves to be drawn. Figure 3 shows the intended general effect of its masses, 
the five-leaved and six-leaved flowers being clearly distinguishable at any distance. Figure four is its profile, rather carefully drawn at the top, to show the tulip and turkskip lily leaves. Underneath there is a plate of iron beaten into broad thin leaves, which gives the centre of the balcony a gradual sweep outwards, like the side of a ship of war. The central profile is of the greatest importance in ironwork, as the flow of it affects the curves of the whole design, not merely in surface, as in marble carving, but in their intersections. When the side is seen through the front, the lighter leaves are real bindweed. Figure 5 shows two of the teeth of the border, illustrating their irregularity of form, which takes place quite to the extent indicated. Figure 6 is the border at the side of the balcony, showing the most interesting circumstance in the treatment of the whole, namely the enlargement and retraction of the teeth of the cornice as it approaches the wall. This treatment of the whole cornice as a kind of wreath round the balcony, having its leaves flung loose at the back and set close at the front, as a girl would throw a wreath of leaves round her hair, is precisely the most finished indication of a good workman's mind to be found in the whole thing. Figure 7 shows the outline of the retracted leaves accurately. It was noted in the text that the whole of this ironwork had been coloured. The difficulty of colouring ironwork rightly, and the necessity of doing it in some way or other, have been the principal reasons for my never having entered heartily into the subject, for all the ironwork I have ever seen look beautiful was rusty, and rusty iron will not answer modern purposes. Nevertheless, it may be painted, but it needs someone to do it who knows what painting means, and few of us do, certainly none as yet of our restorers of decoration or writers on colour. It is a marvellous thing to me that book after book should appear on this last subject without apparently the slightest consciousness on the part of the writers that the first necessity of beauty in colour is gradation, as the first necessity of beauty in line is curvature, or that the second necessity in colour is mystery or subtlety, as the second necessity in line is softness. Colour, ungradated, is wholly valueless. Colour, unmysterious, is wholly barbarous. Unless it loses itself and melts away towards other colours, as a true line loses itself and melts away towards other lines, colour has no proper existence, in the noble sense of the word. What a cube or tetrahedron is to organic form, ungradated and unconfused colour is to organic colour. And a person who attempts to arrange colour harmonies without gradation of tint is in precisely the same category as an artist who should try to compose a beautiful picture out of an accumulation of cubes and parallel lepipeds. The value of hue in all illuminations on painted glass of fine periods depends primarily on the expedients used to make the colours palpitate and fluctuate. Inequality of brilliancy being the condition of brilliancy, just as inequality of accent is the condition of power and loveliness in sound. The skill with which the thirteenth century illuminators in books and the Indians in shawls and carpets use the minutest atoms of colour to gradate other colours and confuse the eye is the first secret in their gift of splendour, associated, however, with so many other artifices which are quite instinctive and unteachable, that it is of little use to dwell upon them. Delicacy of organisation in the designer given, you will soon have all, and without it, nothing. However, not to close my book with desponding words, let me set down, as many of us like such things, five laws to which there is no exception whatever, and which, if they can enable no one to produce good colour, are at least, as far as they reach, accurately condemnatory of bad colour. 1. All good colour is gradated. A blush rose, or better still, a blush itself, is the type of rightness in arrangement of pure hue. 2. All harmonies of colour depend for their vitality on the action and helpful operation of every particle of colour they contain. 
three the final particles of color necessary to the completeness of a color harmony are always infinitely small either laid by immeasurably subtle touches of the pencil or produced by portions of the coloring substance however distributed which are so absolutely small as to become at the intended distance infinitely so to the eye four no color harmony is of high order unless it involves indescribable tints it is the best possible sign of a color when nobody who sees it knows what to call it or how to give an idea of it to any one else even among simple hues the most valuable are those which cannot be defined the most precious purples will look brown beside pure purple and purple beside pure brown and the most precious greens will be called blue if seen beside pure green and green if seen beside pure blue five the finer the eye for color the less it will require to gratify it intensely but that little must be supremely good and pure as the finest notes of a great singer which are so near to silence and a great colorist will make even the absence of color lovely as the fading of the perfect voice makes silence sacred end of section 15 recording by todd albrick end of the two paths by john ruskin